Performing Proper Density Analysis Part 2. In Part 1, we discussed the subjective nature of density analysis and the importance of choosing a proper radius. So let's walk through the Moran's Eye Tool and choose a good radius. Again, that's in the Spatial Statistics Toolbox under the Analyzing Patterns toolset. Unlike point density, where you could use the point data as our input with no population field, the Moran's Eye Tool actually requires that you aggregate your points so that you can use a count of your incidence as a weight. In order to do this, I created a model that aggregates coincident points so that a count field could be used as the weight in the analysis. To learn more about how to aggregate coincident points for this type of analysis, there's a great tutorial in the Geoprocessing Resource Center that walks you step by step through the creation of this model. I ran the aggregation model ahead of time, and I can now walk through using the Spatial Autocorrelation tool to choose the best radius for my point density analysis. We're going to point the tool at those aggregated 911 calls and use the count as our input field. Now we have to choose a conceptualization of spatial relationships. There's also great documentation about choosing the right conceptualization found in the desktop help. But as a general rule, with point data in a density analysis, you'll probably want to choose either the fixed distance band or the zone of indifference. Here, I'm going to use the fixed distance band. The next thing that we want to do is choose a fixed distance. Now for the fixed distance band, we can start with the smallest distance that is still at a scale that we're interested in. Let's say 2,000 feet in this case. Again, this is where you really have to think about the questions that you're asking. When I run the tool using that distance of 2,000 feet, it returns to me a z-score, which in this case is 5.41. Remember, that z-score is measuring how intense the clustering is for our selected distance. I've already run this tool 13 times. I used 1,000 foot intervals up until I got to 15,000 feet. I chose 15,000 feet as my cutoff because after that I thought that the subtle neighborhood patterns that I'm interested in would be lost. I know that may sound a little tedious, but it runs really quickly and the result is definitely worth it. I put each distance and z value in a table and added that table to ArcMap. I then graphed the z-scores, which we can see right here. The graph shows us the global z-score values for 13 different distance bands. And we have a peak right here at 8,000 feet. So now we can choose a radius parameter by letting the data help us. And we no longer have to use the default value for the point density tool. We can use our peak, which in this case was 8,000 feet. So are we done? Let's go back to our half mile radius density map. What if I were to change the classification method for rendering? Usually I like to use the standard deviation classification method because it lets the distribution of the data decide what's going to be bright red and what's going to be blue. It's only appropriate, however, if the data values are normally distributed, which is actually pretty uncommon with geographic data. You can actually see a histogram of the data values when you go into the rendering tool to determine if the data looks normally distributed. In this case, we would expect to see a bell curve if our data were normally distributed. And you can also try other classification methods from here. I've already tried the, quanti the quantile classification method, which we can see really changes our map a lot. Remember, here we're, we're keeping the, the radius constant. So all of these maps have a radius of one half of a mile. And the only thing I'm changing is the classification method, which determines what's red and what's blue. 
I also tried the equal area classification method. With every map that I make, changing that classification method and the number of classes and the color ramp is going to drastically change the maps that I produce. Hopefully, it's becoming clear that there's quite a bit of subjectivity when we try to distinguish spatial patterns from a point map or from a density surface. When the results from your analysis are more than just about creating a pretty map, you really want to move from density analysis to spatial statistics. You'll use many of the same techniques discussed here, like aggregating your data and determining an appropriate scale for your analysis. The results, however, will be statistically significant hot and cold spots, or high and low density areas. Here is a map of hot spots that was created using the spatial statistics tools. It looks very similar, but in this case the rendering scheme is not subjective because the red areas actually represent statistically significant hot spots, and the blue are statistically significant cold spots. If you want to create a map like this, you can download the tutorial from the Geoprocessing Resource Center and learn all about it. Hopefully this video has helped you understand what an important role you play in the analysis process. Understanding the subjectivity that is inherent in your analysis will help you make more informed choices throughout the analysis process, get better results, and ultimately make better decisions based on your data. And here are some resources that you can use to learn more.